Good evening and welcome once again to another program of Issues in the News, where we discuss the important events that would have taken place in our country over the past week or so. And as is usual, we always have a packed agenda. So please invite your friends, invite your followers, invite your neighbors, invite your relatives to join us on this broadcast and Facebook. I want to take this opportunity to welcome all of our viewers who are joining us right across Region 5 and Region 6 on the television, as well as our uh, listeners and viewers who are joining us on Freedom Radio in Georgetown. And I also want to welcome all of our viewers who are joining us right across Guyana on Facebook in the Caribbean and of course across North America and Europe. This is another program of issues in the news. So please take this opportunity quickly to share this program, to send a message to your friend, send a, send a message to your followers and invite them to join us in tonight's discussion. I want to begin by apologizing for that technical glitch which we experienced last week that caused me to abort the, progr the program um, in the first few minutes. Uh, we had some technical difficulties, hopefully we have overcome them and we will not be plagued with any such problems in the future. I want to begin by reminding all of you that the government's online scholarship program is continuing. Ministers have been fanning across the country, meeting the communities, meeting with people, going into the villages, going into the interior, going into all the areas of our country, inviting persons, beseeching persons, imploring persons to apply for the government's scholarship program. It is an online program. It is free. It caters for every segment of our population. It caters for those who may not have the requisite qualifications to enter a university program. We have courses for those persons so that they will eventually be qualified to enter into the university programs that are available. We have diploma programs at universities. We have uh, certificate programs. We have degree programs. We have master's programs. We have PhD programs. The universities are all accredited universities with high academic standing in the world. So the certification that you would eventually receive will be recognized worldwide. The courses that are available are wide and ranging and they are designed to equip Guyanese from every walk of life, from all ages, to take opportunity, take the opportunities that would become available as our country continues to move along this developmental trajectory that we speak about so regularly. We will have to import workers in this country unless we qualify our people. And we said that we will invest heavily in our young people in particular, but in every race and every age, what greater investment can a government make than an investment in educating its population, empowering its population, equipping its population to meet the new challenges which lie ahead. But we have to get our people interested. We have been distributing flyers right across the country. We have been um, putting advertisements on television. We have been putting advertisements in the newspapers. We have been pushing this heavily in the social media, on Facebook and in other, on other platforms. But still, I am not satisfied 
with the response which this program has yielded thus far. I believe that we are a far more intelligent people. We are a people who appreciate the importance of an education. We place premium value on academic qualifications and therefore I cannot understand why we are not getting the type of response that I anticipated. This is the greatest scholarship program unfolding in the Caribbean since independence. There has not been a scholarship program of this magnitude anywhere else. And the programs are free, they are being done online, and you don't have to disrupt your everyday life. You can continue working, you can continue doing what you are doing, and simply study at your own convenience. And at the end of it, you can end up with a degree. And as I said, we have technical um, courses. We have courses for technicians. We have courses for academics. We have courses for computer-inclined people. We have courses for farmers, for motor mechanics, marketing, management, economics, and a whole host of programs. Please, you will regret this opportunity. We are going village to village to talk to you. I went yesterday to, um, to, to Clonbrook on the east coast of the Amarara and I went to Anne's Grove to spread the message of the scholarship program. And I want to take this opportunity to salute the staff of the Ministry of Education for doing a wonderful job in arranging these meetings right across the country in a very efficient and organized manner and in a very professional environment. And all you have to do is to ensure that you get an application form and you fill it out. We can only take the horse to the well. We can't force the horse to drink the water. What is most disgusting is that I learned that there are PNC operatives, AFC leaders, who are in these communities and are telling people not to participate in this program. This program is about education. People in America have to do two, three jobs and still they go to school and they have to pay for that. Your government is paying for you to get an education from a university in India, from universities in the West Indies, from universities in Europe. You don't have to pay. Your government is paying for you. People all over the world are dying for this opportunity. And you are not taking it up here. And you are being misled, I am told, by politicians. Imagine a political leader telling his constituents or her constituents that they should not take an education, that they should not partake in an education program that is being offered by the government. Now, you are not a leader. Any person who does that is an enemy to his own or her own people. They can't fall in the category of leaders. You want to keep your people in a perpetual state of ignorance so that you can continue to exploit them. This has nothing to do with politics. Why would you want to go around into the villages and into the communities to pursue your narrow political ends by telling the people that they should not participate in this program? We are not telling them how to vote. This program is not to, not to make them become PPP. This program is to educate them. This has nothing to do with politics. So I don't understand how callous and cruel political leaders can be to go into the communities and tell people who look up to them for leadership that they should not take an opportunity for free education. 
Those, as I said, are not leaders. Those are enemies of the people. And if you don't understand that, and if you don't see how evil these people are who are preventing you from educating and empowering yourself, then I, I don't think I can help you. What I will tell you is that when the foreigners come into Guyana and they start to take the jobs in the next five years, you can't complain. We are passing local content legislation in this country to ensure that the local people, the Guyanese people, get priority in terms of jobs. But we can't help you to get a job if you're not qualified. The people, the foreigners will come and will take the jobs away from you because you are not qualified and you only have yourself to blame. Because here is a government that is giving you free education at various levels, PhD, master's, public degree, diploma, certificate, and even below that. If you can't take opportunity of that, take up, take, if you can't exploit these opportunities, well then maybe we are wasting our time. But we will not give up. It's our role as a government to go out there every day to ensure that we do our best to improve the lives of our people. That is what we are committed to and that is what we will continue to do. The vaccination program is continuing. The government's vaccination pro program is continuing. And again, we are getting reports that politicians from the opposition are going into communities and spreading lies and spreading misinformation about this vaccine, that it will have certain side effects and a whole host of nonsense. My brothers and sisters, please go and read. Go on the internet, read what PAHO has said, read what the World Health Organization has said about these vaccines. They do not have the side effects that these people are telling you that they have. They will not cause the things that they are telling you it will cause. They are simply playing politics with your life. Let me tell you that they have all taken the vaccines. The very people who have not, who are telling you don't take the vaccines, they have taken it and their family have taken it. But they are coming to tell you not to take it. And apparently people are listening to them. Well, it, the vaccines are the only known scientific response to the COVID-19 virus. It is the only proven thing to protect you against the virus. So you don't take the vaccine, you do so at your personal peril. And let me tell you what is going on in the Caribbean. I am told, and it will be in the news shortly, that countries in the Caribbean, governments, are they're not making the vaccines uh, mandatory, but if you are unvaccinated, then you can't work at the airport, you can't travel, you can't enter public places, and if you are not working, then you will not be paid. And governments are taking this position in the Caribbean now because they can't expose those who are vaccinated to perils because of a few who do not want to be vaccinated. So we may, we may have to move in that direction shortly, but I don't want to preempt. The president will speak on these matters at the appropriate time. But I can draw reference to the realities taking place in other parts of the Caribbean where sanctions have been imposed upon persons who have decided 
not to take the vaccines. So I am appealing to you to please ensure that you get your vaccine shots. If you have the second dose to be taken, then please ensure that it is taken and you are fully vaccinated. I want to move on to deal with an issue that have assumed great moment in the new cycle in Guyana. And it is the government's electoral reform plans. You would know that I have spoken ad nauseum about the government's intention to do electoral reforms both at the statutory level as well as the constitutional level. We have said that we, the government, can't drive the constitutional process because that will have to be consensually or arranged with the opposition because no significant constitutional change can take place in Guyana without the agreement of the two major political parties. So we can't control that component of the process. But we have committed that we will make all the changes which we can make by ordinary legislation. The General Secretary of the PPP, Dr. Jack Dale, said that. The President has said so. I have said so. And perhaps many other persons in the government. And we have not said so now. We have said so from the beginning, even before we got into government. Because of that five-month period where the world came out in support of Guyana's democracy, we can't undertake this endeavor alone. Many persons stood with us and fought with us to defend the will of the people, to defend our democratic process, to defend our electoral integrity. Many persons, governments from 100 countries, every major international organization in this hemisphere, every major local organization in Guyana, they all stood on the side of democracy, on the side of the constitution, on the side of the rule of law. And they fought the PNC, AFC, and those um, miscreants in GCOM fought them off because they were fighting together on the one side to derail the process, to steal the government, to rig the elections. In the end, Democracy prevailed and we said to the world that we will consult widely and we will accept assistance from international organizations, from governments as we move forward, but that the government will drive the electoral process. So the Canadian government has come forward and pledged their support. The U.S. government has come forward and pledged their support. The English government has come forward and pledged their support. The European Union came forward and pledged their support. The Indian government came forward to the Indian High Commission and pledged their support. And we are accepting all support. We are not refusing assistance. But we are driving this process. The American government is assisting through the agency of an organization called International Republican Institute, IRI. 
and the IRI people came here and they met with us, they met with the opposition and they made public a statement that they are working with the government of Guyana and GCOM to fashion these reforms. Lo and behold, I don't understand. There was an explosion after, the, after that. The PNC, AFC, APNU came out firing that they want to be consulted. Well, first of all, Anil Nandlal as a citizen, I as a citizen will not want the PNC, AFC, APNU anywhere close to the, to the electoral reforms because they will want to undermine it. The reforms is to protect the system against them. I, as a citizen, will not do that. But here I am not, I am Attorney General. I am part of a government. And the government is committed to work with all parties. So my views will have to be shelved. But those are my views. You don't go and strengthen the security of your house and then consult with the bandits. Would you do that? Imagine you're putting an alarm system and a burglar proof system in your house and then you're going to consult with the burglars. That is what is happening here. But we will proceed because democracy mandates that we do that. So I don't understand how they can think that they are going to be excluded from the process. Importantly, the process constitutes statutory reforms, law reforms. Law reform can only take place in the parliament. They are the major opposition in the parliament. So naturally, they must play a part. They will have an opportunity to have an input, not only in parliament, but I'm sure outside of parliament. The other issue is that they are rejecting the IRI role. And that is what I don't understand. They say that the IRI, first of all, they have twisted the facts and manipulated the facts, as they normally do, to argue that the IRI will dominate the process. That is not true. No process will be dominated by any extraneous agency in this country. The government of the day will drive the process. And that was made very clear from the beginning. So I don't know, but, you know, that's how they manipulate and they pervert the facts. And they don't trust the IRI, apparently. Now, this is an, uh, this is an institution that has been working in Guyana for years and working with them. The IRI partnered with them in 2011. Worked all over the country, all in the interior areas. In 2015, again, they partnered with them. There was a organized, there was a campaign called "Vote, Vote Like a Boss" or something like that throughout the country. The IRI was their partner. Suddenly, they don't want the IRI to be part of this process. The truth of the matter is that they don't want the IRI. They don't want the process. Reform will make it difficult for them to steal the elections. It's as simple as that. And all that they know, they cannot win an election. They have never won an election. From 1968 to 1992, they rigged. And every election after that, they have lost. I am convinced now that they rigged the 2015 elections using spreadsheets. We were not vigilant then. They used spreadsheets in 2015. So it's not that their objection and their blaming of the IRI is simply a Trojan horse. That is simply to divert attention. Their real objection 
is to the reform itself. Because naturally, they want the system to be weak. They want the system to be compromised. They want the system to be, you know, so that they can wax it and, and, and do their fraud. That is what they want. And, and because that is their nature. Imagine David Granger is brave enough to say that the CCJ, the Caribbean Court of Justice, should not hear and determine our electoral matters. Do you understand the profundity of that statement? Do you understand how warped this man's mind is? Do you understand how diabolical and demented such a thinking is? That you want an, an activity in Guyana as important as an election to be exempt from review by our highest court. You have to have authoritarian instincts embedded deep, deep in your brain. That is what you are seeing here. You are seeing a deep and intense dictatorial underpinning coming from deep within a psychology and a philosophy for a person to articulate that an important event like the elections of a country must not get the review of the highest court just imagine if electoral matters and political matters did not reach to the CCJ, what would have happened in Guyana? Let me brief you. One, James Patterson would have still been the chairman of GCOM. And James Patterson was put there to rig the elections. And James Patterson would have rigged the elections. That is why he was unilaterally chosen in gross violation of the Constitution because he was going there to perpetuate a massive fraud against the electorate of this country. And that is why Mr. Granger doesn't, wa he doesn't want those decisions to be reviewed by our highest court. So had the CCJ not been there, the Court of Appeal decision that Granger acted properly would have been the last and final decision in relation to Patterson. And Patterson would have been there and Granger would have won the election by fraud. Secondly, 33 would not have been a majority of 65 if the CCJ was not there. Just look at the mathematical confusion that would have happened in this country. If just that principle Forget politics, a little politics. Just imagine what that would have done to our mathematics. 33 would not have been a majority of 65 had it not been for the CCG. Most importantly, the no confidence motion would have not been declared to be valid. The no confidence motion would not have succeeded. So they would have still been in power perhaps today. They would not have had to resign and call an election if the CCJ was not there. And worse, Lowenfield would have been able to present a report of completely fraudulent figures to the GCOM for the results to be declared if the CCJ was not there. Because that is what he did. And Granger and his cabal would have succeeded in stealing the government. I thought that this guy would stay quiet. And he would not speak about these matters. Instead, the man says, blatantly and boldly to the world, no shame at all, that these cases should not go 
to the Caribbean Court of Justice. If anyone listening to me thinks that the people have changed, the AP and UAFC have changed, these people must never come close. They must never come close to government ever again because they will not come out of government. They do not know how to be democratic. They do not know how to operate within the law. It, 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 it can't happen apparently. They are allergic to it. So that is the, the fundamental objection that they have to the reform. So that's the PNC. And then you have some satellite organization. This man, Agda, and an organization named Sage, headed by David Hines. I don't know. David Hines lives in America. He comes here ever so often. All this guy ever speaks about is race and ethnicity. I don't know that, I don't think that he knows anything else. He doesn't speak anything else. Just race and ethnicity. And he speaks about black people being excluded and the IRI. You know, they're, they're, every time these people speak, they bang the ethnic and racial drums. Who wants to exclude anybody in this process? The truth of the matter is, nobody wants to deal with the AP and UAFC. That's not our fault. Nobody wants to deal with a pack of thieves whom they saw steal elections. And Granger has the audacity. I didn't even, I didn't get to mention that. The man goes to court. I would love to be part of those proceedings and to cross-examine Mr. David Granger in the witness box in that case. It would be a pleasure, a really, really learning experience. This is a man who blatantly attempted to thieve the elections and then sues when people speak about it. So we have to ignore people like Sage David Hines. He represents no one. The WPA issues a statement. I don't know, you know, why people take the WPA seriously. The WPA saw more than any person, any people, any group in this country, what the PNC is capable of. They met, they sustained the brunt of the violence. Their leader was killed, blown apart by a bomb. A commission of inquiry said Forbes Barnum was implicated. And yet, these people, yet, has to be because of race. There's no other reason. So they have a problem too. But the WPA is dead. It's defunct. It has been dead for 30 years. I don't think the WPA can put a hundred people together at any forum, anywhere. The WPA as a party can put a hundred, no, not a hundred, fifty people in Georgetown. Let them call a meeting and see fifty people come to attend. So that's another dead organization. And the other organization that came out, and perhaps it is the worst one, is the Guyana Human Rights Association. Well, this organization, I really don't know. I mean, this... Since I'm a little child, this guy, I can't remember his name. He has been the president of this association. What is his name again? I can't remember. I don't know. This, this person has to be about 100 years old. Since I know him, he's Mike McCormack. Yes, that's his name. Mike McCormack. Has been there like forever. This, this organization has no deputy. It has no secretary. It has no other member. It has no election of office bearers. What does this organization do? When this country was under siege for five months or six months, and the entire world, the limelight was focused here, you had regional organizations, you had the 
the CARICOM, you had the OAS, you had the Commonwealth, you had the United Nations, you had the Non-Aligned, you had so many, 100 governments. Every organization in Guyana focused on trying to get democracy to prevail and to be victorious in Guyana. This organization never said a word. Not a single word. And today, it comes out of some type of, I don't know what kind of comatose you call this, and makes a statement. Guyanese should simply ignore these people. The human, Guyana Human Rights Association. I don't know. I don't know if it's a, if this organization is a, what type of organization this is, and whose human rights they represent. You know, the other day I included them in a consultation to, to, uh, to appoint the Law Reform Commission. And I regret doing that. I regret doing that. And I will ignore their recommendations because they want to destroy this country. They are not acting in any way beneficial to Guyana. So... Those who are listening to me and Mr. McCormack, your recommendations for the Law Reform Commission is going to be ignored because of your inexplicable position. You, you find your voice only when it is convenient to you. So I wanted to deal with that issue about, but let me assure you that the reforms are going ahead. We are committed to the holding of elections when they are due. GCOM, we are saying, must remove those contaminated elements who are still there drawing people's money after trying to steal government. They are still there and we are calling for their removal. The miscreants who are there, we are calling for their removal. And the quicker they are removed from the public electoral system, the better. I want to deal also with Mr. Harmon. Mr. Harmon has been making the news quite a lot recently. He has been spreading what can only be described as foolish lies. Lies that are so discernible. They are so easily verifiable. For example, I spoke some time ago about him walking border market and telling people that the government has given $25 million in COVID grant to some, I don't know, 100 businessmen or something like that. A ridiculous story, just simply something that, that can't even make sense at, 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 at any level. But that is the kind of diatribe that this guy spouts and he expects people to take him seriously as opposition leader. And he caused a great furore not so long ago in the press by alleging that his budget was caught. First of all, I don't know what he's doing to deserve a budget. What is Mr. Harmon doing to deserve a budget? Tell me, what has he done for any grouping of people in this country to which one can point and say, you know what? This is a good thing that Harmon has done since he is opposition leader. What, one, one good thing. Just tell me one. Why he should he even get a cent? What is he doing with the money? What is he doing with the money? Which grouping of Guyanese he has helped? He went to Barbies 
and he caused near riots on the public road, himself and Granger. And it has been downhill since. It has been one outrageous statement after another. Lies about the oil and gas sector or acted upon complete misinformation is implicated in a whole host of corruption transactions, corrupt transactions, which are going to be made public shortly. So I don't know what has he done to deserve a budget in the first place. But he's entitled to a budget as an opposition leader. And he submitted $92 million, $22 million for local travel, $8 million for janitorial supplies, $10 million for his staff, and he wants $48 million for a Prado, for a Hilux, and for computers. $48 million for Prado, for Hilux, for computers. When Jack Day was opposition, not one vehicle did we get. For five years, we didn't get a vehicle. Jack Day never took a salary as opposition leader. Not a cent, a salary. And our budget was 37 million. 37 million. This man wants 92 million. And with 37 million annually, or thereabouts, we were able to win back a government. We brought them to their knees. We threw them out of office with a no confidence motion. Every day we were in the fields. Every day. That is what we did. What is he doing? And he wants 92 million. 92 million with 30, 30, 34 million. In 2018, we got 34 million. In 2019, we got 37 million. He wants 92 million. Look at what we did. We didn't have a vehicle. They did not give us a vehicle. And we were able to throw them out of government. We beat them two times in one electoral cycle. We beat them at the elections. We beat them at the no confidence motion. And if you count the local government elections, we beat them at 2060 local government elections. We beat them at 2018 local government elections. We beat them four times in one electoral cycle. Four times we beat them with this kind of money. It is not about money, Mr. Harmon, but that is their problem. All they can do is spend. All they can do is spend, and that is what they were doing in government. Spending non-stop. So I am happy that the speaker came out, and the speaker did some comparative analysis to show how, what the PPP opposition was getting and what Mr. Harmon wants. $92 million and a Prado and Hilux and computers and all sorts of things. Well, I don't think he will get it. He got, he got some, he got more money than Mr. Jack Dave got. I am told here he got, I don't know how much money he got here for last year. He got more money, I don't have the figure here, let me see. He got more money than Mr. Jack Dave got. He got 37 million. He got 37 million. And that is what we were getting and below that. So, I had announced a few weeks ago that I would like persons who are listening to make a contribution to the program by asking questions on the Facebook and I will try to answer the questions. I should have said it earlier. So if you have any questions to me, then you are free to put it on the Facebook and I will try to answer it before the end of the program. 
the crime situation. I, I should speak a little about it because it is a serious issue in our country. And it is something that we are grappling with. We have installed within the Guyana Police Force a PR, professional PR unit. We are equipping the forensic lab with all the requisite equipment and we, are, we will be recruiting personnel because we recognize that we have to do scientific investigation if we are going to get a grip of the crime situation. We are also working on a number of strategies and initiatives that are intended to create greater harmony between the Guyana police force and the communities of this country. I think that it cannot be disputed that if the police force is to function effectively, it requires a good relationship with the civilian population. The PR unit is one of the mechanisms that will be used to create the type of relationships that we are speaking about. The PR is to promote the police force and to forge better relations between the police force and every other agency, the press, the private sector, and most importantly, the ordinary rank and file Guyanese. We need to build back trust and public confidence in the force. And getting this relationship going is integral to the establishment of this trust that I'm speaking about. We have resuscitated over a hundred policing groups right across the country. Hopefully, that initiative will go a far way again in building the relationship that I'm speaking about. In the scholarship program, the government scholarship program, we have included over 50 different courses of studies in investigation of a forensic nature directly targeting members of the police force because as i said skill training education forensic type of analysis and investigation is what will improve the capacity of the force civilianizing the force is another important change that we, we are pursuing. And we have a police force where you have a whole host of civilian functions being performed by police officers. So you have the clerk, the secretary, the messenger, the mechanic, the guy who bathes the horse, the man who bathes the dog, they are all members of the police force. These are policemen and women, and they, they are performing civilian functions. Why, why do we need a corporal of police to bear a horse or to clean the horse pen? Why do we need an inspector to be typing a letter for the commissioner of police? But that is what is there now. That has to change. And 
civilians must perform these civilian functions. It is another way of integrating into the force the population, the civilian population. Another way of building trust and building relations. Imagine a, imagine a, 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 a vigilance police station and you have four staff who are performing non-policing functions. The secretary, the person who answers the phone, a receptionist, a secretary, and some other person, they're in the police station. And, you know, they're not police. They're civilians. One live at Annandale, one live at Boxton, one live at Vigilance. Do you know how much that will help the people of Boxton, the people of Annandale, and the people of Vigilance in appreciating that one of their own is working and is part of the Guyana Police Force. These are the types of initiatives that we have to pursue as we continue to work with the force. But the crime situation, we are making a lot of progress. I am not the person who should be speaking on this and within the next few days you will see the statistics and the changes which have taken place and some of the strategic uh, uh, new changes that are being implemented will be disclosed. So I have seen regularly on Facebook supporters of the PVP as well as non-supporters, have been critical of the government on the question of crime. And I will dare say that those criticisms are not without justification. Crime is unacceptably high in our country, but it is one of the most complex issues to deal with. But I want to assure you that we are dealing with it on an everyday basis. That is what I want to assure you, that we are dealing with the situation. It has taken some time. We had to do, and there are many, many challenges, some of which I will disclose later, some of which other uh, more persons who are in the system should be speaking about them, and you will hear them. But all I wish to say at this point in time that I am assuring you that work is ongoing and strategic changes are being made and a lot of new measures are going to be implemented and are being implemented and you will be updated soon. I see my operator is signaling to me that I am running out of program time. I will ask you to submit your questions to me, please do so. And on the next occasion, I will try to take five minutes and respond to those questions. I may not be able to respond to all the questions and I may not be able to respond to them in the manner that you would like me to, but I'll try my best. And on the next occasion, next week, I promise, when we meet again, we will continue this discourse. I want to take this opportunity to thank you very much for spending the last hour with me. And let us continue this conversation next week on another edition of Issues in the News. Please take care of yourself and enjoy the rest of the evening. And of course, stay healthy for the rest of the week. Thank you very much and good evening.